Today's message is titled, Can You Hear What I Hear? Can you hear what I hear? And our text will be from Hebrews chapter 1. And while you're turning there, I just want to ask a few questions. Have you ever miscommunicated your thoughts to somebody as you were trying to convey them to another person? Very easy to do, isn't it? Most of us have, and when that happens, confusion, confusion can become an irritation, and it can be very frustrating as well. I remember the story of a man who was in need of his neighbor's help. He was moving a large piece of furniture, and he lived in an apartment. So he said, I'm kind of stuck. I need to, to get this piece of furniture out of the stairway. Will you come help me? So the man says, certainly I'll help you. And he, they get together, and they are struggling back and forth, and they cannot seem to get this dining room uh, Kuro cabinet Hutch, whatever you call them. Um, I just know they're big and bulky and heavy. And they can't get it to move anywhere. And finally, the man says, I'm so frustrated. I can't seem to get this up and into my apartment. And he says, up? I've been trying to get it down. <laughs> he didn't communicate very well as to what they were trying to accomplish. I'm also reminded of the man who finally decided he was going to help his wife around the house and do some laundry. So he gets his clothes and he starts to put it in the washing machine and he realizes there's all kinds of settings on the washing machine. So he shouts across the house to his wife, honey, what setting do I put the washing machine on so I can do these clothes and wash my favorite shirt? And she said, well, what does the shirt say? He said, it says Florida State Seminoles. <laughs> she was wanting him to look at the tag on how to care for that shirt. Again, they were not communicating very well. Growing up as a young boy in Orlando, Florida, I attended First Baptist Church of Orlando. That's where my membership was. I was saved there and baptized there. And they had a very vibrant television ministry. And at some point along the way, they developed a deaf ministry where they brought in a person who would sign. And as they showed the broadcast, this person would be superimposed on the screen and they would be doing all of the sign language and so on and so forth. And it was an opportunity to reach the deaf community and it grew. At times I remember sitting there watching with fascination over sign language and how they were able to communicate without saying a word. And I was intrigued how they used their hands and their facial expressions. They were just so animated as they spoke to those who could not hear. Well, in my senior year at the Baptist College of Florida, they had a student who was deaf who enrolled and they brought in a person to sign for him. And each week throughout the semester on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, we would have chapel services. So I got to observe that all over again, and it reminded me of my time at First Orlando. Well, that translator was able to speak, and that person was able to hear. And I remember thinking, what if one of my children were deaf? I remember that really spoke to me. What if they were hearing impaired? What would I do? How would I communicate with them? Well, I decided I would certainly learn how to do sign language so that I could communicate with them my love for them and the importance of knowing the Lord as their Savior and how valuable they were to me and that they mattered to me and my wife and that they were, they were cared for. Learning sign language would not have been a burden. It would have been a a joy of love and filled with love, an expression of love. I remember one day as I watched them communicate with one another, I couldn't help but reflect on what God has done for us. I saw that experience as a living illustration or a parable, if you may, as to what God did when he sent his son. Mankind was deaf to God's voice. And he sent his son 
so that he might communicate to us clearly so that we might know God. <clears throat> he loves us so much and he desperately wants to reveal himself to us so that we can understand and that's why Jesus came. And I want to say that is the message of Christmas. God sent his son. He sent his son so that we might know the Father and be saved from the bondage and captivity and set free from sin. And I believe that's what Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 communicates to us. So we're going to take a look at this passage of scripture and I ask you again, can you hear what I hear in these verses? So read with me. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. May God bless the reading of his word. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we are so grateful to have your word before us. We are so blessed to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And Father, I pray that if there are any here who do not know you personally, that today would be the day of salvation for them. That they would be able to celebrate this Christmas in a way like they've never celebrated it before. And Lord, I pray that you speak to our hearts and that you would use the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be a blessing. Lord, search me and try me. If there's any wicked way in me, may I repent of it now so that only you come through and none of myself. For it's in Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. God sent Jesus to communicate a message in a way that we can understand. And the first way that God speaks to us so that we can know him is that we, we were to draw near to him and we can know him because God speaks through the Bible. God speaks through the Bible. Did you ever notice that the Bible doesn't question God's existence? God's just there. There's no attempt in scripture to prove the existence of God. We find that true in Genesis 1, 1, where it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God has always been there. God is there in the past. He's there in the present. He's there in the future. And then in the New Testament, we read in John 1, 1, where it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then in our text here in Hebrews 1, 1, it says long ago, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. God understood and he speaks through his word. God is understood rather and he speaks through his word. He also speaks through his work of creation. Romans 1.20 tells us that for his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. So there is no reason that any one of us can deny the existence of God because he is revealed not only through his word, but through his creation, through Jesus Christ, and through other means that we are going to discuss today. And God has been speaking throughout the history of mankind to reveal himself to us. He wants us to know him. He wants us to love him. And ultimately, he wants us to worship him with pure hearts and clean hands. That is his desire for us. That is why we are created, to bring him glory and to point others to him and to worship him in that way. God reveals himself through his creation. He reveals himself through the sunrise and through the sunset. How many of you have experienced beautiful sunrises and beautiful sunsets that just take your breath away? It's incredible what God does. I remember my first time snorkeling down in the Keys. And also had the privilege to do that in the Bahamas on a vacation trip that we took one time. Man, it is so beautiful under the ocean, God's creation. And all the colors and the vibrancy of his, his masterful touch is just made so clear. God is a master artist. And mankind just barely gets a glimpse of, of what God can accomplish. Through some very talented men throughout the years that we have existed. 
So God reveals himself through his creation, through his sunrise, through his sunset. He, he reveals himself through the sun, the moon, and the stars. The Bible tells us that God slung them into the sky. Because our senses are so incapable of reaching beyond the natural world, we have to see something, feel it, and touch it to believe it. It's so hard for us to stand on our faith and to accept things just because we're told so. God spoke at different times and in different ways that he might be revealed. And if we listen, and if we listen carefully, we can see that God is audible. He speaks to us in a way that we can understand. He spoke at different times throughout the Bible. He's here a little. He's there a little. He's revealing himself. He speaks. He speaks through the 39 books of the Old Testament. He speaks through the 27 books of the New Testament. God is always there speaking. Not as a collection. The Bible is not a collection of just historical uh, wisdom of ancient man. But it's the very voice of God himself speaking to mankind whom he created. Just to give you a little rundown of some of the ways he spoke. He spoke to Moses through the burning bush. He spoke to the, spoke to the Israelites from the smoke and fire on the mountain. He spoke to Elijah in that still small voice. He spoke to Isaiah in a vision at the temple. He spoke through Hosea through his family circumstances. He spoke to Amos in a basket of summer fruit. He spoke to Jeremiah through the potter's clay. He spoke through Joseph in his dreams. God even spoke through a donkey. Imagine that. God has spoken through the angels as well. God speaks in different ways, it tells us. He's spoken at times in visions and dreams, sometimes by a parable, sometimes through a symbol. It may have been a burning bush or that awesome thunder of Sinai through the smoke by day and the fire by night. God spoke. Maybe he's spoken to you in that still, small voice that we experience. God's spoken through natural events, and he's done so by other means as well. There's no lack of variety for God's revelation. He is masterful. It's not some boring activity that always occurs in the same way and in the same manner. God uses various ways to reach men with various senses. We don't all like the same thing, do we? We don't all like the same football team, do we? We don't all like the same foods, do we? We don't all like the same people or the same actors or the same movies or the same cars or the same houses. We have varying and different tastes. God knows that. He created us that way. We are uniquely made by him. So God will reveal himself in a variety of means and ways. Maybe God spoken through the birth of a small child. Isn't it amazing to witness the birth of a child? I cherish those moments in my life when we were able to bring three beautiful babies into the world that God created and knitted in the womb of my wife. And to see them grow and to mature and to experience life on their own now as adults has been an amazing journey. And my experience as a father has shown me more of who God is and more of how he loves me because I love my children in that unconditional way. And I know you feel the same way about your children. Prior to the coming of Christ in the New Testament, there had been 400 years of silence between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew. When John the Baptist arrived on the scene, that's when we heard the voice of God again. And it changed the world. But even all of the glimpses we see of God in the Old Testament couldn't adequately capture the full picture and nature of who God is. We got a little example here and a little example there and another example in this location. But God had always been speaking, speaking through the prophets but the people, as we know, by going through all of the minor prophets, that they weren't getting the message. The message was what? Repent and turn back to God. They ignored the message. It had been given to them over and over and over. They didn't understand God's heart. They didn't understand God's plan. 
And too many claimed to be speaking for God, but instead they were misrepresenting who he was. And out of that came confusion, not understanding. So God shared the message of Christmas through the Bible and through the prophets. But in another way, he spoke the message of Christmas is a way that we can know him because God speaks through his son. Jesus came on the scene. Finally, at last, God sent his son. And that is what we celebrate during the Advent season is the coming of the Messiah. The Lord Jesus Christ, who is fully God and fully man. And God chose to reveal himself in that way directly to us through Jesus, through his message. But he did more than that. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus is the living, divine Son of God who proclaimed God's message. But it's more than even that. Jesus is God's message. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and took up residence among us, and we observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. What a beautiful description. But to some, that's still not enough. I'm reminded of a story that has been shared frequently about a man who was a decent man. He was a kind man by all accounts. He was, quote, unquote, a good man. And he was upright in all his dealings with others, but he didn't believe all this stuff about Jesus being the incarnation of God. Didn't understand it, didn't believe it all. The Christmas time was troubling for him. So he told his wife, he says, I, I can't pretend to go along with this because I don't understand it, I don't believe it, I, I, I just don't get it. So I don't wanna upset you. But I'm going to stay home and, and you can just go to church and I'll remain here. I just can't understand the claim of how God became man. It just doesn't make sense to me. He struggled with, that, with comprehending that understanding of God. Well, on Christmas Eve, his wife and his children went to church and they had a special candlelight service like we're going to celebrate this year. And he declined to go with them. He says, I'd feel like a hypocrite if I go. So I'll just stay home, but I'll wait up for you. Shortly after his family drove away in the car, a light snow started coming down. So he lit the fire and sat by the window and just watched the snow come down. And he thought that was just a great way to spend the evening as he waited for his wife to come home. And after he settled in a little while, he decided he was going to get a book and he would read it and he said to himself, if I need to have a Christmas, at least I can have a white one. He went back to his chair by the fire and he sat down and he opened up that book and he began to read. A few minutes later, he was startled by a thump. Then another thump. Then another thump. Thump after thump started happening against the window of his home. So he, he got up from his chair and opened the door to see what was going on. He, he had no idea what it could be. He thought maybe somebody was throwing snowballs at his house. So he went to investigate. And what he found was a flock of birds had been caught up in the storm. And they were pounding the side of his house because they were attracted by the light. And they were seeking shelter. And he thought to himself, I can't let these poor birds just sit out here and die. They, they're helpless. They're, they're freezing to death. I need to do something. But how can I help them? Then he remembered he had a barn where they kept the family horse for his children. So he goes to the barn, he opens up the door, slings them open, lights several lanterns out there for them to, to come in and see the light. And he goes back to the birds and he tries to shoo them and, and encourage them and go. And they went everywhere except in the barn. So he's getting frustrated. And he thinks to himself, well, maybe, maybe I just frighten them. Maybe... They see me as something strange and they just don't understand what I'm trying to do. And he said, I just can't seem to come up with anything in my mind to, to help them, to get them to know to trust me. 
If only I could become a bird for a few minutes, he said. Perhaps I could lead them to safety. And just at that very moment, off in the distance, he heard the church bells ringing. And there he stood, silent, listening to those bells, bringing glad tidings of Christmas. He fell to his knees in the snow. He said, now I understand. Now I see why Jesus had to come as a man. Now I see why God did it so that I could understand him, I could relate to him, I could touch him, I could feel him, I could believe in him. Jesus came to reveal God in the human form. To make him known to us in ways that we can understand in the writer of Hebrews goes on to say in verse 3 that the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Picture with me for a minute Jesus, the perfect high priest, offering his sacrifice and then sitting down. The great high priest never sat down until... His work was finished. What did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. His work was done. So when he went back to heaven, he was able to sit down at the right hand of the Father because his work was finished. It shows that he completed the task that God had given him to do. What a wonderful thing to realize that Jesus Christ, who is the full expression of God in human history, can come into our lives and provide us the ability to see and to know God. His light, in fact, gives us life itself, spiritual life. And that light gives us purpose. It gives us meaning. It provides for us hope and happiness and joy and peace and fellowship and everything else that we need for eternity to worship him as Lord. His completed work makes salvation possible. The job was done. It never needs to be repeated. We don't have to keep putting Christ on the cross. His work is done. It's over. It is finished. But if you remember from our study in Leviticus on the Day of Atonement, what happened? Every year a sacrifice had to be made again and again and again for the sins of the people. But not anymore. Because Jesus was the perfect Sacrifice the unblemished lamb. And he passed through the veil of the heavens. He made the perfect sacrifice by shedding his blood. And he was the perfect altar himself. Amen. And then the books were closed on that sacrificial system. Hebrews 10, 14 says, For the, by one offering he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. John's gospel describes Jesus as the word becoming flesh and living among us. And if you want to know what God is like, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. You remember when Philip asked Jesus to show him the father? What was Jesus' response in John 14? He says, haven't I been among you long enough to know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the father. Jesus declared in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. They're the same. That is the message of Christmas. It's not just the fact that Jesus speaks through the, or God speaks through the Bible. It's not just the fact that God speaks through his son. But the message has the power to transform our lives because God speaks through his spirit still today. God speaks through his spirit. Christmas is a celebration of the greatest message ever brought to mankind. You know what it is? It's one word. Emmanuel. What does that word mean? It means God with us. Amen. God came so near to us so that we could draw near to him. And when that time came for Jesus to return to heaven, there was a void. There was something that was going to be missing because he was no longer going to be in our presence. But God had a plan for that too. You remember what Jesus said before he departed this earth? I'm going to send you another. I'm going to send you a helper, and he will be with you always. God gave us the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus is the full expression of the radiance of God's glory. Just as the rays of the sun express the sun, so Jesus Christ expresses the Father. He expresses God to us, and, and the, the only radiance that reaches us from God is what's radiated to us through Jesus Christ and his spirit. Look again at verse 3. It says, Jesus is the sustainer of all things by his powerful word. And as we learned in verse 2, he not only made all things, he is also the heir of all things, and he sustains all things together as well. Jesus holds the world together. He was a part of creation. He holds it together. He is in charge. And guess what? He can hold your life together too. He promised to send a helper, and that helper is the Holy Spirit. When your life is surrendered to Christ, he holds it and he sustains it through the Spirit. And one day, he will take you into his presence and we will be able to worship. Unhindered, without any distractions. Can you imagine that day? Oh, what a day that would be. But we know the opposite is true. Because a life without Christ, one that's not sustained by him, is a life of chaos. It's a life of extreme trouble as much as scientists like to claim they can create as much as we as human beings like to think that we're in control God is the one who created not us we're just imitators God created everything out of nothing he can do what we could never do both materially and spiritually the psalmist says in Psalm 51 that he can create in us a clean heart. We can't do that. Our hearts are inherently wicked because of sin. Therefore, if, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He can do it out of nothing. He can take you from wherever you are, create something new, and transform you from within. There is nothing in your life that is beyond his ability to touch and to change and to make new. God is enough. We don't need God and. All we need is God. 1 Timothy 2.6 says, Jesus gave his life as a ransom for all. That's the message of Christmas, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Jesus came so that God could reveal himself and his plan to us in a way that we could understand. Jesus came to proclaim God's message so that we could be set free from sin's bondage and stronghold on our lives. Jesus came to transform our lives and he sent the power to do it. He says, when that helper comes, what did he tell us? He said, you'll be able to do even greater things than I have done. We have the power to overcome because of the Holy Spirit. Why would he do that? Why would... God do that to us and for us because he loves us. He wanted us to know that we were created for a reason, that we might know him, that we might love him, that we might proclaim him, that we might worship him. We don't have to live in the prison of guilt and shame. We can be set free from all of those things. The Spirit gives us the ability to hear the message. So again, I ask, can you hear what I hear? The Spirit gives us the ability to obey the message. And when we obey the message, we will be transformed. So if we're transformed by the Spirit, then there'll be evidence of that transformation. Logic just makes that a reality, doesn't it? What are some marks of a transformed life to a follower of Christ? Well, first of all, we are fully Devoted and surrendered to Christ. Secondly, we're dedicated to the truth of the scriptures. We're connected to other believers through the church. We have an evident prayer life together. We put the needs of others before our own as we're instructed to in Philippians. We share the gospel message regularly with those that are in need. We use our spiritual gifts for kingdom growth. 
We use all of our talents to glorify God. And we have a servant's heart. And we actually serve others. If that describes you, then you are a person who is living a transformed life. Praise God for speaking to us. Praise God for speaking to us through the Bible. Praise God for speaking to us through his son. And praise God for speaking to us through his spirit. But you know we have a problem, because sometimes the message of Christmas gets lost, especially this time of year. Seems like when October comes, the, the rest of the year is just a blur. We have family get-togethers for Thanksgiving, and then we are decorating the house, and we're, we're moving things in and moving things out. We're shopping, we're making lists, we're sending cards, we're having parties and get-togethers and gatherings, and we're just overwhelmed sometimes. And we're trying to do all of that in the midst of, of working, some of us, and, and others are, are just physically exhausted from all that we try and accomplish in such a short window. And because of that, we're easily distracted, and we pursue things that take us away from God. And there's certainly other messages that we hear this time of year in particular that are louder than the message of Christmas. But in the midst of all our struggles, know that there's a message from God. It's a message of hope. It's a message of love. It's a message of peace. God tells us, nothing whatsoever can separate you from my love. God speaks these words as well. Trust in me with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge me and I will direct your path. In the midst of life's betrayals and bitter messages, he whispers, forgive those who mistreat you. Love your enemies and those who persecute you. During our times of trouble, he proclaims, do not fear. Many are the afflictions of the righteousness, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. In the midst of life's blessings and joy and celebrations, he shouts, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. That's what we need to hold on to. That's what we need to remember. I want to ask each of you, I'm going to speak just another minute or so, to just close your eyes and bow your heads for a minute. Maybe some of you are going through some tremendous struggles right now and you haven't let anyone really know what's going on. I want to encourage you to talk to God. Talk to him about what you're going through. When you have a need, you can go to him, and he will understand. You know how I know he understands? Because he knows what it's like to have physical needs. The Bible tells us that Jesus said, Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So if you're in need of something, he knows what that feels like. He knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to be thirsty. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows there isn't a problem that you've been through that he can't relate to. So spend a few moments to just talk to him and share what's on your heart. Approach his throne boldly. Jeremiah says, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and wondrous things that you do not know. Psalm 46 tells us God is our refuge and strength. He is a helper who is always found in our times of trouble. So if you are struggling, go to him in your time of trouble. You can call on him when you're tempted. The writer of Hebrews tells us that he was tempted just like us. The only difference is that he never sinned. Whenever you're tempted, we need to follow his example. What did Jesus do when he was tempted? He went to the scriptures. When Satan tempted him, Jesus responded by quoting scripture to him. Secondly, let God speak to your heart. Let him speak to your heart. You can also call on him for salvation. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, according to Acts chapter 2. As undeserving as we are, God will save us if we call on him. 
Has there ever been a time in your life where you've called on him to save you? If not, you can do that today. This can be the day of salvation. It can be the day of salvation because Christ has already done the work. There's nothing that you can do that can bring that about. It's only through him that we are saved. Do you hear what I hear? Can you hear what God is speaking to you? He loves you. He cares for you. And he has a precious gift for you this Christmas season, and that is the gift of eternal life. Are you listening to his voice? <clears throat> Believe in the message, and your life will never be the same. Let's pray together. Father, as we are humbly in a time of reflection, we thank you for speaking to us through your, through your word, through your son, and through the spirit. And we just ask you to take away all of our distractions right now. Let us just spend some focused time. Just our heart with yours. Let us reflect on the true meaning of Christmas. And help us to eliminate the distractions that keep us from hearing your voice. Lord, I pray with all my heart that if there is someone here who has never surrendered to you by confessing their sins and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the one way and the only way that they would do so today. Let this be their Christmas that is full, that is full of joy, that is full of hope, that is full of peace, that is full of passion to serve others because of the transforming power of the Spirit that we receive when we do those things. Lord, I can't think of a better gift that we could receive at Christmas than the gift of salvation. Renew our hearts, renew our minds, and may we worship you in a way that we have not done in the past. Let us be thankful for the blessings that you've given us rather than complaining about the things that we think we need or want. Open our eyes to the struggles that people have around us and let us be generous towards them rather than shutting them out. Lord, we know from your example it's better to give than to receive. It's better to serve than to be served. So instill that in our hearts. Let our Christmas be filled with joy. And may we bring the hope of Christ to others in the process. And we pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.